and here, um, one of the greatest men that have spoken into my life. And uh, Pastor Pancho has been a mentor to me for about 12 years. Um, he's been just a strong pillar in, in my life, my family's life. And, um, and he's an awesome ministry. He's got a prophetic voice. And he's going to be with us on Friday night. We are inviting the youth group. Uh, he, pa pastor Pancho is a former youth pastor. Uh, he was a young adults pastor. And then he was a campus pastor up in Portland, Oregon. That's where I met him. Um, now, in about seven weeks from now, he's going to be um, planning a church in Austin. And um, a church called Planet Shakers. Um, Austin, Austin Planet Shaker, something like that. And um, he's he's a true man of God. I'd love for you to meet him if you've never met him. I'd love for you to hear his hear him speak. He's got a he's got a great great heart um, for people. So please please come on out next Friday. That's the twelfth, seven o'clock, right right in here. Okay, you guys good? Yeah, man, it's so good to be here. Um, it feels like we've been in and out for a while, but uh, we're glad to be back, and we're glad to start a, a new series, a new series, uh, and we're calling the series Simply Grow. Woo! Grow, yeah, somebody wants to grow. Who is that? Adi? Adi, my friend? My friend? My love? Uh, <laughs> grow. <laughs> grow. And um, how many of you here just just want to grow? Like, period. I just want to grow. I, I don't want to be the same. I want to be where I'm at. Uh, if you've arrived, if you don't, if there's no more growth in your life, I'd love to just spend some time with you. I'd love to get to get to know you and get to know your secrets. But um, I am constantly trying to grow. I don't claim to have arrived. I don't claim to have any knowledge. Um, of, of where uh, I'm at today. I want to grow. I want to grow in the things of God. I want to grow in the things of God. I want to grow as a person, as a pastor, as a friend. And so uh, I want to look at just some very simple. So I just want to shoot from my heart, if that's okay, and just share uh, a little bit of, of two people in the Bible that I want to look at in their growth process. Two people. And, and that was Siri, by the way. That's Siri. That's Siri. Want to her, hold on a second. She's always interrupting. That chick. Yeah. Okay. Peter. Peter, awesome man of God. Uh, let me open up with this. Two, two, uh, two verses, and then, and then we're going to get into this. Second Peter, chapter one, verse, verses three through eight says this. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and for godliness through our knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness add knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in an increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And a couple chapters down, Peter says this. Chapter 3, verse 18. This is the last um, recording scripture from Peter. It says, but grow, but grow, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. 
another verse, uh, Judges chapter 16. This is this is Samuel. Big my Samuel, long hair Samuel. Samson, I'm sorry, not Samuel, Samson. <laughs> Thanks for correcting me. Yeah. Samson, long hair, strong dude. Delilah. He says this. So the Philistines captured him, gouged his eyes out, took him, and took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. And before long, his hair began to grow again. Before long, his hair began to grow again. Again, you know, the heart behind our series grow is simply this that we want to be leaders. My wife and I want to be leaders, we want to be faithful leaders of, of a group that says, I want to grow. But I'm not just here just to be a part of a, 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 a ministry or an organization, but there's something inside of us. Our desire is to lead people that say, I just want to grow. I want to get to know the things of God and I want to understand the scripture and I want to apply the scripture to my life and I just want to grow in the things and hopefully, hopefully someday that it's not going to just be about me but it's going to be about somebody else that when I grow, that when I plant myself and when I sprout up and when I grow that I would be able to provide shade for someone else. That because of my growth and my opportunity and my leadership and my commitment that I'm going to provide some nourishment for someone else that may need it. On, on May 1st, let me tell you where, where, where I started with this. May 1st, 2016, I was in a prayer meeting. Saturday morning, uh, this was a, uh, a weekend of, of promotion. Um, some of our people here had completed three years of, of impact and they were, we had some, some prophets come, we had some guest ministers come, and it was a weekend of, of, of ministry and presbytery. And uh, I was in this prayer meeting and I, and I had this very clear vision that I want to share with you. This is, this is, where, we, this is where we started with this growth thing. I had this vision, I had this picture. I was in prayer, it was a Saturday morning, early morning, and I had this picture of of a hand, and it was the hand of God, and it, above, beneath his hand was this field, like this grass, it was, it was artificial turf, very similar to this grass out here, it was, it was just this, the fake grass, it was clean, it was, it was, it was very uh, cut evenly, and it was, it was very just clean, and, and, and I seen the hand do this, I seen the hand peel away this artificial turf. And underneath this turf was this bed, this soil, was this very clean, very watered, very nurtured uh, soil. And on this soil was a bunch of seed. And I began to see this hand just nurture this seed. I began to see this hand take care of the seed. I see this hand uh, take out the weeds. I see the hand pour water. And I'm praying for lift, by the way. I'm praying and I'm asking God, God, how can we, how can we be good shepherds of your people? God, these people just aren't here. It's not, it's not just a gathering, God. These are, there's people here that have callings on their life. There's people here that are, are pastors and leaders. And there's people here that, that have gifts that need to be developed. And God, how can we, how can my wife and I be good stewards of these people that, of this ministry called Lent? And then I see the hand begin to nurture and foster and rub. And all of a sudden I begin to see different. I see, I see the seed disappear and then out came like a new turf. Real turf. Real turf. And that turf began to provide shelter and shade. And it began to provide a home for, for many. And I had, I had the the thought, this is God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow. He wants you and I to grow. When I think of, when I think of growth, I think of my story. 
I want to share just a little bit of my story of, of us growing. Um, let me show you this picture. This is, this is our family <laughs> way back when. We had just given our life to Christ maybe, maybe a year or so after this picture. And uh, as you can see, like God has done a work in James. <laughs> and my wife and he's working on me actually that's a troll smile that's, that's a troll smile that's a troll smile <laughs> truthfully probably the happiest time of my life truthfully this is um, I mean that's just that's how we smiled back in the day and uh, <laughs> I remember that time. I remember we had we were just experiencing the things of God. We had just given our life to God. We started seeing the hand of God move in our life. We started to see favor. I mean, our life has just been a, a, a life of favor and, and the hand of God on our life. And I remember at this time thinking to myself, if God does nothing ever again in my life, he's done enough. He saved us. From hell. He saved us from misery. He saved us from, from, from pain. I remember as a kid, I remember as a, as a little kid, my, my early memories were, were, were not very good. They were my, my parents, I, I watched my parents' uh, marriage just fall apart because of drugs and alcohol. I watched my parents' fist fight. I watched um, my, my, my dad beat my mom with his hands. I watched, I watched my mom run over my dad. I remember, um, I remember getting in a car. My dad jumps in front of the driveway. My mom runs him over. I turn back. I look out the window. I see my dad holding his arm, blood coming out. This was my life. This world was normal to me. I watched my mom uh, begin to sell drugs and try to earn a living. And I watched hundreds and hundreds of people coming in our door, buying drugs and, and selling drugs. I watched uh, our house get raided. I watched our house get robbed. Uh, I watched all these things. As a kid, I would help my mom package drugs. It was very normal for me. I watched just, I was a part of a life and a culture that just was, was a constant, like it was tearing down. Nobody ever lifted anyone up because we, we would just go through life and experience these things and, and there was no structure, there was no love. It was just chaos, it was just misery. And I remember even just growing up with these things and all I wanted to do was I wanted to be a better drug dealer than my mom and my stepdad. I wanted to, the goal for me was just to not get caught as much, to not see my stepdad go to prison, to not have my house raided. I, I, I would be thinking about how I could get a house on a hill where I could see the cops coming up and then we would, we would hide all the drugs. As a kid, that was the goal, that was the dream. You grow up in this lifestyle, there's not very much future, there's not very much hope. I absolutely knew, I knew this would be temporary, I knew this wouldn't last, but this is just what I wanted, this is just what I was used to. I remember in the fifth, in the eighth grade, um, we dropped out of school. Found out, heard from somebody somewhere that we weren't going to graduate, so we decided, why go to school? We stayed home, my mom was in jail, there was thousands and thousands of dollars underneath her carpet in the corner by her bed. So we, every day, we go to McDonald's, we ate McDonald's, and she, we rented this house. My mom had this house, she had a roommate, but we rented this house, we ate McDonald's, and we drank beer every single day when we should have been in school in the eighth grade. I remember this was my life. It was just, it was just chaos, it was just torment, it was just, it was ugly, but this is all I knew. My brother and I spent thousands of dollars that summer. I remember we got a call from the school, from Fisher Middle School in the eighth grade. They're like, where are you? Why aren't you in school? We're like, oh, we heard, we heard um, we weren't gonna graduate. They're like, from who? I said, from my friend. <laughs> and I'm like, get to school, like, you'll graduate. So we went back to school the last two months. And we actually graduated. And you know, we said, like, this could be our last graduation. Let's do it right. Let's party. <laughs> I 
I'm not kidding you, we had, we rented a limo. Eighth grade graduation. We rented a limo and we had a condo for the after party. And it was a, my last graduation. <laughs> so we did it right, we did it, no. Uh, I remember this was normal life for me. It was just chaos. I wasn't growing. I wasn't doing anything. I was just kind of being in the cycle of, of this crazy life, not growing, not having a future, not having a hope. Um, I thought school wasn't for me. I for sure wasn't going to do school. So I just thought I had to be street smart. And one thing I did love, the one thing that was good in my life was sports. I love sports. Played baseball, played football, and... Um, it wasn't long after that summer of the eighth grade, it was about a year later, I was playing sports and I met my wife. I know I told you guys the story, but I'll tell it to you again. <laughs> I remember I was playing sports, it was a, it was a game, we, had, we knew each other, our friends knew each other's friends, and we invited them out to our game, and, and uh, where I was playing um, shortstop. I see this, this girl walking down the strip, and I was like, damn, look at this girl. <laughs> so my friend, that's, that's my girl right there. So I'm like, no, it's not. I'm like, yeah. So I'm playing shortstop, and, and for some stupid reason, I got like stutter shades on playing shortstop. And I'm like, you know, like making plays, and I'm throwing, I'm looking at the stands, and I see Jenny, she's like, oh my God, I'm like, that was so cool. And I'm like, yeah, there's more. <laughs> she like she fell in love with me, and I was like, "Yeah, I love her too." Though, no. yeah, we began for the first time in my life. We began to grow. We weren't we weren't in church, but we began we began to grow together. We were able our relationship caused us to cut out some people in our lives. We cut out some of our friends and some of our family because we were we were spending time together, uh, lots of time together. And that grew, and that grew. Our, our love grew, our, our 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 love grew for each other. And for the first time in my life, at the age of 16, I feel growth. And. When we were 16 years old, we had our first son. And that was rough. We were, um, we were, didn't know what to do. They should have called us to do a show. 16 and pregnant, they didn't call us. They would have been, <laughs> we would have been a good, a good show. It, our, our life was chaotic. We didn't know Christ. All we knew was what we see. Alcohol, drugs. My wife has a very similar, uh, thanks man. Uh, I'm gonna hang on to this. If it pops one more time, I'll, I'll grab it. Thanks. Uh, all we knew was the same thing. All we knew uh, what, what we see. And she has a very similar story. Her, her parents were very abusive, a lot of drugs, alcohol. And, um, and so we, we were trying to grow, we were trying to start a family, we were trying to, but we were young and, and dumb. And after our first son was born, um, we, we were constantly fighting, trying to work things out. Anyways, we found out at 17 we were pregnant again. We, not we, she was pregnant again. <laughs> <laughs> During that, that time we had I had met this this guy who happened to be a youth pastor, Pastor Jerry. And I met him playing sports. He played football with this youth group and invited me to play softball with the youth group. And I, I met him playing sports and as I got to know him, he was the first guy at my life at the age of at the age of 17 to plant some seed in me. The first guy that would tell me that he was proud of me. The first guy in my life to tell me that I could be somebody. The first guy in my life to tell me that 
God loved me. And God has a plan for my life. And I grew up, the thing is, I grew up in a, in a, in a, in a crazy environment where my grandmother was, was a Christian, but all she told me was that God was going to punish me. She tried to get me to stop doing all these crazy things by telling me, if you do that, God's going to punish you. So the last thing that I wanted to do was to go to church or serve a God that was going to punish me because I did a lot of bad things. So church was nowhere near my radar, but I met this guy and he began to plant seeds in me. He began to tell me how how much I was valued. He began to tell me how much I could do something if I if I submitted my life to Christ. I at one point, one night I submitted my life to Christ. Gave my life to Christ and my life changed dramatically. I remember I went from just feeling down and depressed and lonely and suicidal to in the, in the very second after praying the Lord's Prayer, I felt like I wanted to live. I felt like I wanted to be alive. I felt like there was a purpose for my life. I felt like I was called to do something. I just felt loved. And if you lived your whole life, if you lived your whole life a certain way, you've never been loved and you've never been accepted and all of a sudden, you, you feel this love and acceptance. It's, it's, it's a life-changing experience. And that's how I know the power of God is real. I felt this power. I felt this experience. And I began to uh, serve God with my whole heart. I began to, we began to go to church. And we submerged ourselves in this church. We, we planted ourselves in that church that, that where we gave our life to Christ. We were committed every single week. We were at this church two nights, three nights, four, five nights a week at times, just serving at this church, giving at this church. I remember my family saying, what are you doing so much at this church? Do they pay you? And I'm like, no, actually, I pay them, you know. <laughs> I pay my tithe and offering. And they're like, you're crazy. What are you guys doing? But we were so thankful for this God. And all of a sudden, my wife and I began to grow. We began to grow. All those seeds that that pastor had sown into me, that I was going to be somebody, that God had a plan for my life, that, that we, were, we, were, we were somebody that no matter, what about, no matter what our past looked like, God could turn it around. And then every single week, every single month, and every single year, we began to grow. Leadership. We plant ourselves. We submitted ourselves. Let me tell you about planting and submitting. It doesn't mean that we always agreed or we always got along with that, with that leadership, with the pastor. It means that we were submitted. We were underneath him no matter what. And we trusted. We trusted that God would do something. We submitted to this church for 12 years. We served this church for 12 years. And we grew. And we grew. We were started out as ushers. When we started, then we were on the leadership team, and then we became teachers, and then we became pastors at this church. We just started to grow because we submitted. We just started to grow because we submitted. We planted ourselves. And then we, we, we learned this leadership principle. It's called the law of of the lid. It's a John Maxwell principle. We, we, we learned that, that, that to grow, you're only, we're only going to grow as, as much as our leaders were. We just felt this kind of tugging in our heart to, to leave that ministry. And so we, we wanted to make sure we didn't leave out of, of, of um, anger or with any differences. So we began to re uh, pray for about a year. And we fasted for about a year to make sure that we were hearing God correctly, that we just want, didn't want to make an emotional move. And we felt the Lord saying, okay, it's time to go. So we started finally looking for a church, and we looked for uh, this church called Evangel. Because we wanted a church that believed in the fivefold ministry. So we're looking for uh, a church called Evangel. We couldn't find Evangel. Someone told us, oh, it's called Gateway now. We said, okay. So we look up Gateway. We find out 12 years ago, almost to the day, today, July 31st, 12 years ago. <laughs> I told you I laughed in the eighth grade. <laughs> 12 years.
years ago. We showed up July 31st in this building on that side over there. I remember our first day, we knew absolutely nobody. We walked in, we, 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 had, uh, we said, okay, what do we do with our kids? We took our kid, we took James. I think I would stay with us. He was like in middle school, so he, was, he didn't want to try it out. So we took James to Children's Church. They were in the M NPR. I remember this little short Mexican dude opened the door and gave my son a hug. And I was like, man, that's crazy. Not, not the short Mexican dude, but like, just the hug. <laughs> and I was like, man, that's cool. Like, that's not, that's not normal. That's, we didn't want to to that. We walked into the back of the church, true story, walked into the back of that sanctuary. We sat down in the very, very back row. Worship began. I remember Pastor Ani, he was kind of bluesy worship leader. He was just like worshiping, kind of blues guy. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. This is, this is cool. We knew absolutely nobody. I remember the worship ended and then and the pastors came and they began to do the announcements. And I heard this, true story, I heard this so clear. I heard God say this, and if you plant yourself, you will grow. You can learn from here. So if you plant yourself, you can grow. If you plant yourself, see, we could have went to FCC, we could have chased all these things. We could have drove to, we could have drove four hours to another church just to go get our goosebumps and just to go get our fix. But, but the Lord said, if you plant to yourself, you will grow. And that was 12 years ago. And my wife and I are committed to growing even more and more and more. Let me show you how, how our family has grown. This is this year. And I'm smiling more. Yeah. <laughs> but our family has grown. We, we have, uh, of course, our, our beautiful daughter, who's going to be 12 and not 16. <laughs> Just reminding myself. And we have two beautiful daughter-in-laws to be. We're growing. If y'all don't know, uh, James and Anna. Anna's here. Where's James? The word. I guess you're not married, so you don't have to sit together yet. <laughs> but two beautiful daughter laws to be. Our family is growing. We are growing. And we are so thankful to have planted ourselves here. They got to do it. That's all right. God said if we plant ourselves that we will go. Let me just give you what, what it means to grow and how do we grow. It's a very simple, very, very simple two-step process. So in order to grow, number one, you must be planted. We must be planted. Peter says this, he says this, the very, very, very last words that Peter has ever said. Let me, let me tell you about Peter's story really quick. Peter, Peter was a great man. He was part of the three closest to Jesus, the inner circle with Christ. He, he over and over again, he's seen, he stood by Christ as he, as he gave miracles, as he performed miracles, as he loved the unlovable. He was there when at the Mount of Transfiguration, he was there when the 5,000 people were fed miraculously. He was there. He watched this. He stood by Jesus. Jesus loved him and, and cared for him. And, and he, was, he was, even was participated in the walking on water. That's crazy. Peter's life was, was he was an ordinary man, a fisherman. He was called by Christ. Peter left everything and he planted himself in Christ. He didn't waver. He didn't wander. He didn't say, well, there's another thing going on. Or there's another conference going on. And there's this or that. He planted himself at the calling of Christ. And it was Peter who, who was with Jesus the sanctum of the garden of Gethsemane. 
It was Peter who was there at the last communion, the last supper. Peter was also the one that found himself. He cursed Christ. He denied Christ. He, he blew it. He messed up. It was Peter who also reconciled with Jesus on the beach after he left the ministry and went back to his old vocation. Reconciled with God. I believe this. Out of all the things that Peter's experienced, the greatest thing that Peter ever experienced was that reconciliation with Christ. After blowing it, after messing up publicly, he denied him, he cursed Christ, he left the ministry. But the greatest experience in his life was this, that he experienced the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. It was Peter who stood on at Pentecost and preached. And guess what he preached? The love of Christ. See, once you experience something, that becomes your message. If you've ever been loved by God, your message becomes the love of God. If you've ever been forgiven by Christ, your message, your, your, your sermon, your preaching is that Christ can forgive you no matter what. And if you've ever grown in anything of God, that becomes your message. That becomes your, your soapbox in your pulpit. And you stand and you say that God can. Yes. And so Peter says this in his very, very last words. In, in the book of 1 Peter, he tells the church, he tells this church, hey, things are going to get tough and things are going to get rough, but stand strong. I know you're suffering. I know you're persecuted, but stand. And three years later, he writes the book of 2 Peter. And this is his very, very last words. This guy probably has wisdom and revelation beyond measure. He's probably he's seen so many miracles. But his very last words to the church, his very last, last instruction is this. Grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important for the church than to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But to do that, you must plant yourself. Peter would not have had that experience if he didn't submit, submerge. See, when we submit, we submerge, and we go under, we submit to leadership, you submit to the house. When you submit and you go under, then there's a covering. There's a covering. Colossians 2.7 says this, let your roots grow down into him. Let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Psalms 92 says this, he says they are planted in the house of the Lord. Then they will flourish in the courts of our God. The growth process is simple. The plan is this. You plant yourself. The second, the second thing we do is it's a process. It's a process. I remember my, my daughter and I were trying to grow tomatoes one day. Walking, we're walking through Home Depot. That plan. We've seen a tomato package. We've got the tomato package. We put it into this little planter box. And, and we just didn't know what. I've never grown anything in my life. Ever. And we began to water every day. And we waited. My, my daughter and I just watched and watched and watched. Nothing. Nothing. Are we doing this right? What's going on? And all of a sudden, one day, one day, Dad, 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 you see this, you see this, you see this little sprout. This little green thing. And I remember the excitement, like, yeah, like, we did it. We did it. Now we can make salsa. <laughs> <laughs> Tomato soup. Ketchup, yeah. <laughs> 
because of this little little sprout that you begin to grow and begin to grow and my, the excitement in us begin to grow and we just we bought cages we didn't know what we we bought cages because we seen that somewhere and <laughs> <laughs> excited I wonder how God feels when he sees you grow I wonder how excited our father is when you say Man, I'm gonna go to that Thursday night meeting. I know, I know, I know there's a lot of things to do, and I know there's 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 distraction, I know there's something else going, I know there's another church, I know, I know, but when, when you grow and you come and you say, you know what, I, I'm gonna apply this verse to my life, I'm gonna pray just a little bit, and there's just growth. I wonder how our God, our Father, sees you. It's a process. It's a process. This whole thing about grow, growing is you don't give up. You don't give up. We read Samson earlier. Let me just tell you real quick about Samson. Samson. Samson was called by God, anointed by God, set apart from birth. The angel came to his parents and said, I'm calling your son. He's going to be great. He's going to be mighty. He's going to deliver the, the Israelites from, from the Philistines. And he's going to be used by God. So take care of yourself. Grow. Don't eat this. Don't drink that. Grow. Watch over your son. He's going to be great. Samson is born and he's doing this. He's living what he's supposed to do. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, here comes a girl. It's always a girl. <laughs> Guys. Samson falls in love with the enemy. Not, not Delilah, but with this Philistine. And they tell him, no, Samson, no, don't, don't do it, Samson. And he says, I love her. Judges chapter 8, he says, I, I, I love this girl. Love just, love just messes us up. He says, I love this girl. And, and the Philistines are like, no, we know this guy's call. We know his purpose. You can't marry, you can't marry Samson. He's gonna destroy us. He's sent by God. And so they 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 trick him on at the wedding, they trick him, they, they give him this riddle that he couldn't solve. And at the wedding, he he loses the bet, he can't solve this riddle. He goes to fulfill for some reason, he doesn't wait. He leaves his own wedding, he goes to fulfill this bet. He comes back from paying his dues to find out that his bride is remarried to the best man. I don't know if it's the best man, but it makes the story sound more dramatic. <laughs> she's remarried. He goes to claim his bride and she's remarried. Could you just imagine the hurt, the pain, the discouragement that this man of God is experiencing? Called by God, planted by God, used by God. And all of a sudden, he begins to go on this crazy, crazy killing spree. Get this, doing what he was called to do, but just out of a bad heart. Killing the Philistine people, burning villages, hundreds and hundreds of houses, killing people. And he goes, and then he goes and he finds himself in this cave way up in the mountain, just broken. Like, you ever, you ever find yourself so like, I messed up, like I've blown it. Nobody will understand, nobody will forgive me, nobody will. See, this is, this is Samson's life, and he comes out from this cave, and he's so defeated, and he's so messed up. He loses focus, he doesn't feel called by God, he doesn't feel like he has any hope, any future, and he's vulnerable. He's vulnerable. Then they send Delilah. Delilah's prostitute. Samson doesn't care. 
can't see straight. He's broken. He's vulnerable. Samson, Delilah begins to whisper in his ear, what makes you so strong, Samson? What? Tell me. And, and, and Samson begins to, he knows what he's doing, but he can't not do what is right. He knows that Delilah is the enemy, and he still can't. At first, he was strong. At first, he starts, he lies to her, and he says, oh, it's, it's if my hair was braided, um, or if I was tired, tied by a new rope, uh, he says these things. And after after the third try, Samson, uh, Delilah begins to wear him down. And she said, Samson, if you love me, you'll tell me. Let me tell you guys something. Be careful when you're vulnerable. Watch out for the Delilahs in your ear. I try to tell you, why are you going there? What's over there at that church? It's different. It's not the same. They don't honor God. They don't, they don't do this. They, be careful when you're vulnerable. For the Delilahs that begin to tell you where your secret is. Samson gives up, and he says this to her. He says, it's, he says, it's my hair. He says, I was set apart. I've never cut my hair as a Nazarite, and that is what my power is. You see, his power wasn't his hair. It was his heart. That's where the covenant is. That's where, that's where Christ dwells. That's where, that's where the promise is. is. That's where the seed is. Is, is in our heart. And Samson gives his heart to Delilah. And she tells the guys they shave his head. He finds himself. They gou gouge out his eyes. And he's in the bottom of this dungeon. And he's just grinding grain. He's just walking in a circle. Aimlessly. Hopelessly. No hope. No future. And he's bloated. And he's messed up. Maybe you've never messed up before. Maybe you've never been in a dungeon. Maybe you've never, maybe you've had never had a, a, a something hit you so hard that it caused you to lose hope and lose lose vision and lose lose everything. And maybe maybe maybe, maybe you have a maybe there's somebody here that says this that says you know I've blown it I've messed up I don't have any hope I don't have a future. This part is for you. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says this, that Samson prayed this prayer. He said, God, would you remember me? He said, would you remember me? And the Bible, some reason, some way, says that his hair began to grow back. Grows again. Here's a promise to you. You will grow again. Wherever you're at in your faith journey, wherever you're at in your walk, wherever, wherever defeat you land in, wherever, wherever you are, you will grow again. That is a promise from God. He loves you. He's for you. He's got a plan for your life. And he wants to see you grow. Mike, can we sing that song? Can can you guys stand with me for, I want to give just this opportunity, just this invitation.